tonight is, um, in my mind, what Tuesday evening is all about. An uh, established artist with a reputation that has endured over th a 30 year career, due at least in part to his diligent pursuit of ideas with honesty and sincerity, but also with a willingness to risk the security of that career to follow his ideas wherever they take him. Ken Little comes to us tonight from San Antonio where he lives and works as an artist, teacher, and as of late, a musician. While born and raised in Texas, he left to pursue an art career and spent almost 20 years divided between New York, California, Florida, and some places in between before returning to Texas in 1988. He entered Texas Tech before leaving as an architecture major and left with a degree in art in 1970. Upon graduating, Ken immediately began making and teaching art. His influence as a teacher and an artist spans the country, having taught at the University of South Florida, the University of Montana, New York College of Ceramics at Alfred, um, University of California Davis, University of Oklahoma, and the University of Texas San Antonio, where he teaches today and has for the past 16 years. His art has been recognized um, in numerous ways, including two individual artist fellowships by the National Endowment for the Arts, one in 1982 and another in 1988. Um, also, um, two uh, sculpture awards by the Virginia Group Foundation, one in 2001 and again in 2002. Um, also, with numerous exhibitions, including Ken Little, Shattered Portraits and Unlikely Heroes at the Kohler Art Center in Show... Uh, I can't believe I'm having trouble <laughs> pronouncing this. This is Wisconsin. Thank you. Sheboygan. Sheboygan. Wisconsin, a solo show. I practiced that and practiced that. I knew it'd stump me. Um, a solo show for uh, the inaugural exhibition at the Fabric Workshop, Workshop Gallery in Philadelphia, where he um, also was awarded a residency, and a solo exhibition at the Fine Silver Gallery in San Antonio, I have to say, one of San Antonio's finest. Um, most recently, um, he has had, a, most recently, a broad survey exhibition, Ken Little, Little Changes, was organized by the Southwest School of Art and Craft that began in San Antonio July of last year and has traveled to Salt Lake City, Utah, the Art Museum of uh, Missoula in Montana, where it closes this week before traveling to the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art in Omaha, Nebraska, and then finishes um, its tour at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. In his artist statement for the catalog, Ken wrote, as early as I can remember, I knew that I wanted, um, to be, I wanted to be an artist. That has remained constant in my life. And tonight, I would like to conclude my introduction by borrowing from Patrick, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce his last name, Skokard, with the University of Washington his introduction for the catalog, and I apologize for not pronouncing his name correctly because he just did a beautiful job talking about Ken and his work, and I'm gonna use that to close, as I said, before introducing Ken and letting you hear from him directly. Okay. Simple, beautiful formed creatures, cooked and reduced by the, durability exqu the durably exquisite craftsmen that emerge from a quiet negotiation with a past that includes country music, rock and roll, a West Texas family, art and the American culture of his times. Always in this quiet negotiation is desire to move closer, to understand, to become conscious. Philip Guston spoke of this process when he said, the life of an artist is a long, long preparation for a few moments of innocence. In this case, the, pre the preparation is in the forming and doing, and it is on this rich ground that you meet my friend, Ken Little. Please welcome Ken Little. especially, and a little nervous because of, of all the uh, great friends in the audience, but they've all seen my slides, so <laughs> they can maybe remind me if I forget the right jokes or something. Um, art, making art is an interesting thing. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, in looking at it uh, from where I am at this point, which is basically 34 years out of graduate school, that I've met some really great people. Some of them are in the audience here tonight. And, um, 
and I wouldn't have given that life for any other, uh, doing any other thing. Uh, the arts are really important to this country and to the world, I believe. And I hope that um, through these sort of trying times, we can find more strength and solace in, those, in, the, in the visual arts and in, in the beauty and things. Um, I started making art when I was about as young as I could remember. I don't ever know why I decided to do that, but for some reason I, I, I uh, decided I wanted to be an artist. I grew up in Amarillo, Texas, so there really wasn't a reason, you know, for me, or there weren't, there were actually there were not artists around that I could uh, uh, consider as role models. Uh, and I wrote this paper. This is a paper my mom sent to me after I was... Uh, when I turned 50, and it's something she kept, and I wrote it when I was 13 years old. I'm going to read you this paper. It's very interesting. It's, uh, and then I'll tell you what grade I got on it. Uh, <laughs> so I wrote this in about 1959. I was probably 13 years old. And it says, Ken Little, period two, my utopia. My utopia would not especially be a certain quiet place where everybody sits around all day smiling on fat stomachs and smoking their favorite pipe, generally doing nothing. To some people, this would be great, but for me, I like a little more complicated life. <laughs> I've proven that over the last 30 years. Not a life where everything is given freely to anyone who just de desires it. Life means more if you put something into it. Everyone must do his share. As someone once said, what I gave I still have, and what I kept is lost forever. You gotta understand this is a 13 year old kid writing this thing. <laughs> my utopia would be my ambition. I would be very satisfied to sit by and watch the rest of the world if I could reach my own personal goals in life, but until I realize these goals, I don't think I could be happy in any kind of environment. It might be pleasing for a while, but there would be still a deep yearning to fight for and win my goals. I would be much happier struggling along towards these goals rather than sitting back and doing nothing. I should have been a politician because I haven't really said anything yet. <laughs> like most people, now this is where it gets to the, cuts to the chase. Like most people, I would like to have world peace, freedom from sickness, and general overall good conditions. Maybe someday in the future this will come about, but you really can't hold your breath until it happens. <laughs> so. So in the meanwhile, I will try to work towards my utopia or ambition. I want to be the most famous artist of the 20th century. <laughs> now this may sound silly or just like some stage struck kid, but I'm serious. The idea of becoming a run of the mill commercial artist haunts me. And you have to listen to this. I would rather not be an artist than be lost in the crowd. Now I don't mean I want to be another Rembrandt or Michelangelo, but rather something more along the lines of Norman Rockwell. <laughs> I love art, and if they offered it six periods a day and you could still graduate, I would take all six. My utopia is my ambition, and my ambition is my art. Um, <laughs> so I really knew my way around the block with that, but uh, I, I have always wanted to be an artist, and, and my idea of what they are has been changed and redefined a lot by the, by the artists that I've met and the people that, that I have as role models, which, a lot, some, like I say, some of them are here tonight. Uh, I did this uh, in the first grade, and uh, I show it to you not because I think it's a great work of art, but because this is a theme and something that's come up in my work over and over again and, and that I'm still doing today in different kinds of ways. Uh, You'll notice that, I think, when, when uh, I go through these pieces. Uh, this was stuff I did after I got out of graduate school, and it has, it's called First Situation with Hay. I did this in Florida. It has generally a lot of sort of rhetoric about it, which uh, had to do with graduate school. Uh, I was making these things in Florida in an area that was, that was uh, due for, uh, uh, to be torn down, and people were living on the street there. And, uh, I think a lot of these, these, this, this work, this first situation, and these situations basically came about as, as a reaction to that environment. I was a ceramicist, and uh, uh, this is a piece, uh, untitled piece, but uh, obviously makes reference to pictographs in American Western art. I love Charlie Russell and 
Remington and, and the uh, Amer uh, Northwest Coast Indian pieces. Uh, I've spent about the first 15 years of my artistic career as a ceramicist. Uh, this is a piece I did that's embedded with uh, uh, broken ceramic shards, and this was done in the 70s. Uh, I almost drowned out of a canoe once. Uh, actually, I was in the canoe, and then out of the canoe, and then back in the canoe, but, uh, and this was a, uh, generally a self-portrait made about that. I had always done portraits and, um, of, of people that I loved and knew. This is a portrait of my daughter, Faye, who happens to be here in the audience tonight. This is called Faye on the Ottoman, and uh, this was uh, done in 1977. And this is a portrait of uh, another friend. It's called Bear, B-A-R-E. Some of you may know her. She's a painter named Mary Warner. And then these are slides from basically a, uh, uh, I did a lot of workshops in ceramics, so I started doing performances. And I did these sort of metaphorical performances with other performers. This one was like a 45 minute performance, and these are just still shots from it. Basically, which, uh, where I rolled around a lot of ceramics and broke them up and rolled clay in them and, and you know, laid under them and slept with them and did all sorts of things to them and with them. And, uh, this performance work um, was very good for me in the sense that it kind of got me out of uh, the ceramic kind of workshop thing and um, helped me a lot uh, in the sort of performance things that I'm working on right now. This was a piece, uh, this is from 1980, and this is, a, uh, this is a portrait of my brother Joe Ed, who is, uh, who is a a cowboy, lives in Wyoming, he's a farrier. And this is painted ceramic and it's a little over life size. And uh, uh, it's oil painted ceramic. It's another performance, Blossom. Sorry, these showing performance slides is a little bit uh, well, it's sort of like kissing your sister, you know? I mean, it's, it's I didn't have a sister, but uh, uh, performance takes time and, and sound and, and all those things and puts it together, and you just are really seeing snapshots, the visual images from there. These are uh, two uh, ceramic portraits uh, with me standing in between. One is of my brother Mark, uh, which is the one to your right, and he's a, a jazz piano player, a world-class jazz player out of Berkeley, California. And those are patterns that I, abstracted from his music to paint on that sculpture. And then that's actually the first pieces that I ever used any shoes on, which I used a lot later. The piece on the left is the one that sort of retired me from ceramics because it's totally covered with broken shards. And, it's, and it is broken more than one time and I've had to go fix it and recover it. And uh, it's, uh, I really began to start to use other kinds of materials to try to get away from this uh, problem with ceramics. Also had the idea that I wanted to really work in the world of artists. The art world is, is, a, is, a, is a complicated set of layered hierarchies, you know? Ceramics, printmaking, photography, uh, and all, a lot of media hierarchies. And then there's sort of conceptual hierarchies too, like Western art and, and uh, wildlife art and modern art and stuff like that. I wanted to work in a broadest sense and to try to span some of those things and uh, I started making these pieces uh, out of shoes uh, and boots. Uh, that's called Daddy. And I really didn't want them to just be taxidermied heads or mounts that were just uh, trophies on the wall. I wanted them to be sort of mythical figures that were in another world, not, not in the world of, of, the, of the forest or the big game animals where they were, their natural environment but in other, uh, other places. So this one is on a, a model of the Merrimack, I mean the Monitor, I'm sorry, this is the Union Ironclad during the Civil War. This is the Union Ironclad. I did the Merrimack also, but I'm not gonna show you a slide of it. So this is a wolf on, on, a, on, the, on, a, on the Merrimack, on the, on the Monitor, I'm sorry. Um, these animals and these sculptures I considered to be inhabitants of our cityscape and our psyche. They are portrayed as travelers in a state of transition physically 
and spiritually. I really don't see them in their natural environments as the forests of North America. They're big game animals, symbols of the natural uncontrollable landscape or the frontier. As our psyche, they're the parts of us that we are smarter than but can't control. They are the true sublime, our subconscious, the dreamscape, the other. They're essential, they're dangerous, they're hilarious, they're gruesome, they're cute, they're trash, and they're art. This is called Fury. The last one was called Shave. It's pretty easy to see. This is a pig made out of baseball gloves on, the, on a Plymouth Fury from the 50s. It's made out of uh, jeans uh, and clothes that are stapled on there and painted uh, and uh, with all those sort of belts and ties blowing through the space that's created there. And this is a piece from 1985. Uh, it's called Burn. Uh, this is sort of um, where I sort of where I've finished with these pieces. I still make pieces like this, but this was sort of the pinnacle for this kind of stuff that I, that I worked on. This one has a, a car that's upside down and he's standing in made out of a dictionary and it's a Corvette. And then the uh, house over his shoulder is made out of the book of Exodus out of the Bible. So it's the, it's the uh, story of the, uh, the Jewish people uh, walking through the wilderness following the burning bush. And uh, it also makes, I th for me, makes a, a not too subtle reference to Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus, the, the lady on the clamshell. Uh, uh, or is it the spring? What, maybe that's the wrong title. Is it Birth of Venus? Um, when I build these pieces, I ha I'm a sculptor, and so I, I, I make a lot of welded armatures. In order to make these armatures, I would first do these drawings. These drawings are made by blacking out the paper with charcoal and then taking an eraser and erasing out the, the, the drawing. So it's very much like carving, if you've ever carved anything, because you're adding light or you're capturing light you know, with your, with your uh, medium. Um, and I wanted these things to be like masks, or, or uh, I wanted them to be about the masks that we wear. We have masks for our, 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 you know, our cars, we have masks that are our houses, we have masks for uh, our institutions, for our buildings. And uh, so these things were really basically shells with all the useful or the functional parts removed. It's really got only the sort of the, the, the idea or the style part about it. This is a 57 Chevy. Uh, when I was doing these in New York, I had a really good friend, a filmmaker named James Benning, who said, you should make these in, in metal. And uh, then I came and met, re-met uh, uh, an old friend who's here tonight, Harry Geffert, who, who helped me at Green Mountain Foundry, uh, was indispensable in teaching me how to uh, model these things, make the molds, uh, make the waxes, and cast them. Harry's a legend in Texas. Uh, literally a legend in Texas, and uh, he's a, a wonderful man too. So, started making these things. This is uh, cast bronze, uh, and that's from the from the drawing. These are not really animal heads, but rather they're masks or helmets. The difference lies in that they incorporate prominent features from the animal's appearance or anatomy, but they've been carefully simplified and somewhat personified or animated. It's also very obvious that they're hollow. The sensory openings are in fact openings, a place where the soul or the spirit enters and leaves. When I think about the feeling I want these helmets to give, I think about that instant of recognition between predator and prey, a point of departure, an embarkation, transfiguration. It's actually a simple yet important realization that we are small yet integral parts of this natural evolving ecosystem. I'm reading you some sort of statements that I've written, you know, out of shows uh, when I get to some of these pieces. So these are the bronze masks uh, from the 80s. They're somewhere between, uh, you know, Roger Rabbit and Winnie the Pooh and Northwest Coast masks. Uh, they're, they're really an amalgamation of a lot of different kinds of things. And to me, they're mostly, uh, they're zoomorphized. In other words, they're, 
they're people looking like animals instead of animals looking like people, but you know, it's sort of six and one half a dozen together. This is a horned toad. This is Fort Worth. There should be some people clapping. <laughs> what do you say? Go frogs? Froggies? What is it? Okay. This is a, 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 at a residency at the Kohler Company in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, where uh, that Terry was talking about. Uh, I had been up all night here. Uh, I had the night before cut myself with a grinder and spent all night getting stitches in my leg uh, and then getting, supposed to meet this photographer to take pictures of my work. And of course, the first thing he did is says, kneel back there by your work. <laughs> so I was gr trying to hold my grimace back and, and uh, he, he was taking pictures. But This is an installation at the Washington Project for the Arts. It's called The Elements of Progress, Dreams Escape. This was a pretty complicated installation that involved uh, uh, this sort of natural side uh, 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 diorama and then a sort of uh, acculturated or cityscape uh, across from it. What you see there are basically uh, these animal masks with these no bug lights in them, you know, so that they don't attract any bugs. And then there's a picnic table with the words sleep and train blinking on and off in, in there. So that's sort of what we do. We get up and we train and then we sleep and then we get up and we train and then we sleep. And, um, and the um, cloud of houses that's floating from that sort of nature section over to the civilized section is a, actually a group of houses that are, that are made out of the entire text of the New Testament. So it's from, from the first page to the last page. I started making things out of paper because uh, all the armatures that I had been working on with the animals were uh, paper underneath. They were paper mache so that I could screw and nail the shoes and they would hold. And they always looked pretty good, you know, without any shoes on them. So I started to, d to think about what kind of paper could I use to do this. So I started using uh, dictionaries, Bibles, uh, dollar bills you see in this piece right here. Uh, this is a piece called Cross, and it, uh, it's a pretty complicated piece. It, it, it involves a soundtrack, uh, and uh, the, the tape recorder is inside the house there that you see that also has a black and white television in it. And uh, the house is made out of charcoal briquettes, or the things that basically are, you know, the, the, the place that, uh, we, sort of the, heat, the hearth of the fire, the place where we come to tell our stories. And um, inside the house is this black and white television just tuned to, you know, television, the commercials and the soaps and everything. And then there's a stack of Bibles in that house. And then the tape is playing between, their ta the two money heads are talking back and forth. And the man is describing the house in terms of uh, legal terms and property descriptions and financial uh, terms. And then she's talking about it in terms of the way that she wants it to look and the way that she wants it to feel, and she's talking about the soap operas. And then mixed through this soundtrack, things happen like a toilet flushes, a phone rings, you know, uh, dishes are being washed and stuff like that. Uh, he's actually suspended by that lead and redwood car you see over on the very, your very left, and then she's suspended by that stack of dishes. And the title comes from the fact that their, their hanging wires actually cross it's out of the picture, you can't see it, but they cross it there at the top. So this is a, 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 a and the installation around it was something I was working on. Um, these are actually appropriated drawings from, from my daughters. Uh, one, uh, those drawings there are both uh, phase drawings actually. One of them is called the, bullet, the unicorn running from the bullet from nowhere. Uh, that she made when she was about nine years old. And then the other one was a little girl who is whispering in the shadow of her father's ear there on the, on the far right. Uh, I was trying to, you know, I did a lot of performance and installation and I really wanted to pull these things back into objects. So I, so I tried to manicure in, in a formal sense, sort of bring them back to, to something that's more manageable. This particular piece is called hip. And in a, in a sense, it is sort of a left brain, right brain piece, you know, bicameral uh, nature, uh, 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 civilization sort of kind of piece. 
Uh, and it also makes a funny reference to sort of the lights you see in everybody's windows when they're watching TV. You know, when you drive down the street and you see that blue light coming out of everybody's window and you know that they're all watching TV. And then this uh, hippo, uh, for me, was a, a, a very much a service symbol of, of the natural, sort of the thing like, I mean, he's, he's sitting on a, a uh, boxing ring and he's got this little tiny fence around him and he's, under this, he's on this sort of hot plate neon thing. So it's sort of like the way that we consider national parks, you know? You put a fence around it and you say, this is what's natural, this is our natural park, national park. But it really doesn't ever stay there, you know? I mean, it really, um, it's all around us and we're sort of in it right now. Uh, but that's the way it's uh, generally kind of uh, regarded. And then, of course, uh, it's Apollonian and Dionysian too with the left and bright brain stuff. I'm trying to get through these slides so I can sing you guys a couple of songs, because that's what I've been doing. Okay, this is a piece called Ford. Uh, it says C. Dick Run, and it's a, dic uh, a Ford made out of a dictionary and a coyote made out of shoes and belts who's learned to sit and, and uh, sit like a good boy and, and learn his lessons. And this is called Wheel of Desire. This was actually a companion piece to what the next piece I'm going to show you. This is a piece about our about the things that we want or the things that we strive for, or the things that we wish we had, the things that we desire. Uh, and so it's really about uh, your extremities, your, your hands and what you reach for. Uh, and let's see, they're called uh, desire, so, grit, here, please, and hey. And uh, they were, it's, this was something that sort of came to me. Uh, I've been going to Hawaii and, and uh, I was sitting on the beach and started drawing these uh, sort of stigmata faces and hands and, and uh, basically came up with these sort of things that are basically referred to uh, your first language, the language that you have before you can speak, before you know, know how to use uh, actual verbal language, be more like a body language. This is the companion piece for those. These are the feet. This is called victory and defeat. <laughs> and, uh, and it is funny. Uh, this piece has a lot of sort of classical, artistic, uh, formal things about it. It's in, it's in Renaissance perspective. In other words, it disappears as it goes back. They get smaller. So uh, each generation has a victor and a defeated uh, within the, within the uh, set. And then it goes back from uh, being five inches long to being five feet long up at the front. And this is basically what I was thinking about is the way that our personal lives overlay with other personal lives and becomes like a community or a family. And then the way that those become uh, like a state and then it becomes a nation and then eventually it's like world history. So it's like the overlay or the inlay of your sort of personal history within what is world history. And, uh, and these were made out of earth uh, uh, and they are feet. So it's the way that we walk around on the earth, the way that we make things happen. A lot of this stuff, I mean, I didn't start making these pieces and say, that's what I want to make that piece because it's, you know. Uh, I think of this stuff afterwards. Uh, I, what happens is I get, I get an image stuck in my mind and I just have to make it. And in the process of making it, a lot of this stuff is revealed. And because these pieces are nearly 10 years old, um, that, you know, I, that's what I know about them so far. But I didn't know that when I started them. Uh, if I knew, if I generally know what I'm doing, then I usually don't have to do it. Uh, I usually make art as a question as, instead of a statement. And uh, then it usually answers itself over a period of time. This is the back of victory and defeat, uh, showing the smallest pair, and also shows these sort of, this was sort of a, a pun on the commodification of experience. Uh, we have a place in San Antonio called Sea World, where they have great big you know, dolphins and whales that jump around. And, and I, having a couple of daughters, we went there a couple of times, and, or a few times. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things when people come from out of town, they want to go to SeaWorld, and you think, oh, God, you know, but okay, whatever, we go to SeaWorld. So we do. And so you watch the whales jump in and out of these tanks and stuff, and you see all this stuff. And then you have to walk through the gift shop on the way out. <laughs> and they have little stuff, you know, whales and, and things like that. And I, so this was sort of my 
take on that. Uh, these are all small sculptures that relate to basically the images that I've made before, and they're cast bronzes. Harry Geffert cast most of these pieces. This is Blow Bunny. So, remember the snowman? Well, you've come a long way to get back to where you are. <clears throat> This is an installation from uh, Art Pace in San Antonio. It's called the Elements, no, I mean, it's, it's called Soaring, the Rules of Engagement. And this particular piece is fairly complicated too. It's, uh, I turned the gallery upside down, I put the lights down along the, 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 the corner of the floor and put the art on the ceiling. So there's two neighborhoods up there of houses, one's Apollonian, one's Dionysian. Uh, one's very Cartesian and very organized and very rational. The other one's very uh, jazzy and sort of playful. And, and uh, uh, then there are these floating sort of figures that are either floating or falling between that are made out of dollar bills. I call them money angels. And then on the floor, there's this sort of sphinx-like chocolate bear cross that's, that's basically a, a, a male and a female together. And it's... Uh, 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 a big chocolate bear laying there, you know. Uh, and, and I use the, the wheel desire pieces in this particular piece, too. Okay, these, these pieces are from 1999. Uh, this is from a show I did at Fine Silver Gallery. I had an opportunity to show at this gallery, and, and uh, these... Uh, these were actually, actually also the last pieces that I was able to work with Harry on. Harry's working on his own now. And uh, these are cast in bronze and they're on steel tables. Um, Dave Hickey wrote an essay about these pieces and I had to write him a statement about what I felt about them and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that statement. He asked me what artists uh, I, had, I was referring to with these pieces, and I said, well, one of the artists that I would refer to is Bryce Marden. Uh, I think of a series of linear drawings that I saw at the Manila a couple of years ago. They were exquisite spare lines moving and intersecting. There was a very subtle color. I could have imagined the color. They were always contained in a tasteful square frame. I wanted my last sculptures to have the similar exquisite spare movements and intersections of lines enough so that they would sing through a kinesthetic response I have to them when they are good and finished in the studio. His drawings never bled off the edge of the frame. They were always contained within it, and the shape of the frame being a boundary as, as a simple parameter within which to perform this gesture. My animal and furniture forms are the equivalent to me of the frames. They provide the same boundary or parameter within which to perform this gesture. This is a cougar and some jackrabbits. I also uh, have always been really interested in ven uh, popular vernacular music like uh, ha hillbilly music, uh, Hank Williams and uh, of course Bob Wills and all the, those people. And so I was telling Dave that uh, working within uh, one of the, one of the uh, influences was Hank Williams. Working within the popular vernacular of hillbilly music, he used a vocabulary of subjects of ordinary things always within a deceivingly simple formal structure, very much like my belts and shoes. His methods and his melodies and sentences floated through these, ex like these exquisite lines. I've been describing uh, almost always, I'm sorry, his melodies and sentences float within these exquisite lines that I've been describing almost always within a simple structure of a two or three chord song. And yet there are surprising intersections like, I don't care who thinks we're silly, you be daffy and I'll be dilly and we'll order up two bowls of chili set in the woods on fire. <laughs> and my hair is still curly and my eyes are still blue, why don't you love me like you used to do? Uh, these are things that I've seen and felt directly within my work. A surprising intersection would be the meeting of a high heel pump and a leather belt turned into an eye socket or an ear. When I was working on these pieces, I deliberately tried to find things that could not possibly work in the place where I was going. 
and I found out almost always with a little improvisation and a different viewpoint, I could come up with a perfectly logical dislocation of the object, the same as a surprising intersection. Thelonious Monk uh, was another connection that I had uh, in, with these pieces, the great jazz pianist and composer. Um, he, <clears throat> he uses the same, uh, uh, with a slightly more formal complicated structure, but the same exquisite floating lines and logical dis dislocations. With a lot less improvisation and just as much of surprise as a large a dose of zany humor is another connection, Spike Jones. Some of you might know Spike Jones, the old guy from the 40s who had the, had the uh, crazy musicians who did all kinds of things, whistles and, and tanks and stuff. Uh, I like, I like Spike's seriously supercharged humor and how it always comes close to anarchy and yet always careens back within the structure. These are all parallel and kinesthetic responses to my work and to theirs. That's called Dawn. And it's a deer made out of uh, belts and uh, shoes and a chair. This is the show I wanted to make when Chris asked me to do the show, and it's the show I eventually made that's traveling as little changes. These are suits uh, that are doing different things. They're occupied, but their occupants are not immediately visible. This is a drawing for Pledge. This is a piece made out of dollar bills, and it's called Pledge. Um, this is the show called Little Changes that's traveling around right now. This is called Soar. This, this is the suit. So these are over life size, slightly over life size, uh, uh, made out of you know wire mesh and welded structures with dollar bills glued on the outside of them. The dollar bill is a really interesting thing. It's uh, actually the most plentiful copyrighted object in the world. There's supposed to be about seven trillion of them out there, and uh, they try to keep tabs on them. Only about four trillion of them are in the United States. About three trillion of them are not in the United States. One of the things that I really liked about it is the dollar bill is just a piece of paper with a picture on it. I mean, it really is just a piece of paper with a picture on it. And so it functions uh, through this system of faith that, you know, I'm going to give you this and it's a dollar bill and it's worth my cup of coffee or whatever it's worth. So I really like that idea that that. It's a, that it's a functioning abstraction and that it's uh, basically an article of faith or a, or a document of faith. This is called past. And this is called Oz. Uh, I made this after the Tennyson poem, Ozymandias. Some of you may remember it. Uh, basically, to paraphrase it, it was uh, uh, he meets this stranger from an antique land who set out in the desert. He saw two vast and trunkless legs of stone, and written on those legs it said, My name is Ozymandias. Look upon my work, she mighty in despair. And he looked around, and there was nothing. Uh, I'm, I made this actually in the run-up to, uh, to the war, and uh, my own feelings about uh, that. And you know, this is uh, uh, an American Ozymandias, I guess. And I was also trying to make some feet and hands, and uh, I got out to my studio, or studio, and I thought, I looked at my hand, and I thought, Jesus, I don't know where to start, you know? <laughs> How in the hell would you start a hand? So I thought, well, first I'll make a finger, and then I went, oh, the finger. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is called bird. <laughs> and... Uh, it makes reference to Charlie Parker, who was the bird, but also to Constantine Brancusi, the bird in space, the wonderful sculpture uh, in the early part of last century. Um, and I had a, have some interesting stories about all these pieces. Of course, everybody who sees them, you know, says, oh, how many dollar bills? Or, oh, isn't that expensive? Or, where do you get the dollar bills? And are they real? And, yes, they're all real. And, uh, it's a lot cheaper than paying Harry to cast them. <laughs> it's, or, or me making them either. 
Casting this in bronze would have, would probably, what would it be, Harry? Probably 10,000 bucks, something like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but in making it out of dollar bills, it's about 600 bucks, so it's cheap, basically. Uh, and I also worked on trying to get the dollar bills that had been graffitied or drawn on or notes written to or different things that people do to dollar bills. And I couldn't get them back from the Fed, but my cashiers at the bank started saving them for me. So when I would go in, they'd say, oh, we have one for you. And I went in and one day, and, and, and uh, I said, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I, I saw one, but it's, it's way too nasty. And I said, hmm, I pay extra for those. <laughs> So somebody had written the F word, F U, you know, and uh, so it's actually on this piece. You can't, you can't. I don't know if you can see it in the slide, but <laughs> this is uh, called uh, Father, as in George Washington and the Father of Our Country. I had this idea that I wanted to make this big head out of dollar bills, and uh, and like I say, I didn't have any real sort of meaning in mind when I started to do it. I just had the image. And when I thought about it, and as I made it, and as I've looked at it since then, I've thought of a lot of things about it. One is that, for, first of all, it's, it's sort of like, it's very much like the political electable head, the talking head. It's very much a combination of John Kennedy and Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton and George Bush, if you can imagine that kind of combination. And it really is all about their image and their appearance, and yet it has none of the working parts. It has no brain, has no uh, uh, teeth, has no uh, you know, eyeballs or any of that stuff. It's just about the appearance and the way that it looks. So it's really about appearance. It's not about function. It's also really blown up, and it's empty inside. Uh, and uh, No, I think it probably is. But uh, not directly, of course. Very respectful, you know, Harry. <laughs> it's, uh, it also, for me, uh, very much reminded me of the huge decapitated parts that I saw around Rome when I was traveling around Rome. Those big, you know, see heads and feet and hands everywhere that have been taken off buildings and they're just sort of laying around. And they look, you know, it's hard to know if they look restful or like decapitated, that's not a very uh, nice thing. But anyway, the other thing that they looked a lot like, this looked a lot like to me was the Brancusi sleeping heads that he carved that were the muse heads that, that I liked a lot. So, um, and, and just as a sort of an interesting aside, personally it also looks a lot like me and my father too. Uh, and I guess that's just because when I start to make a nose with steel, you know, the, one, the nose that I know the most about is the one that I've looked at in the mor every morning, you know, for, for 56 years. So, so it has a tendency to just sort of creep in unless I really uh, work on it not being there. But so there it is. You see a little bit about the way those are constructed. I had a real hard time getting into the female parts of these pieces. I didn't know how to get to the female parts, and then, and then they just started coming like crazy. And uh, this is called gown. And then this is a very large piece. It's called uh, miss. And uh, it's, a, it's about eight and a half foot tall uh, recreation of basically a 50s bathing suit, you know. Uh, a strap or a topless, not trop, it's not a topless, that wasn't the 50s, strapless, strapless bathing suit. And then I'm going to show you a couple of slides just from the installation of these pieces at the Southwest School. Uh, it was really important in this installation to paint some of the things pink. For, this, for the basic reason that the money has this real tendency to get real uh, serious and kind of fascistic in a way just because it's all sort of marching across these pieces the way it is. And I really l wanted the pink to lighten things up. Uh, was interest had several interesting conversations, one with my friend Gene Heistein from New York who said, you know, these are really just classical figurative sculpture, but when you put the dollar bills on it, it cheapens them. <laughs> you know? 
And basically, he's right. What it does is it takes them out of the sort of high art realm and puts them smack dab in the, in the world of popular culture, which I like a lot. Uh, so these are slides from the installation of the retrospective. And you see some, a lot of the pieces that you've seen in the earlier slides there. So this is the show that's traveling. It's actually in Wyoming right now, and it'll go to the Bemis and then St. Louis and in Lubbock, actually. Um, what I've been doing in the last, the last year and a half is writing songs. And uh, I told Terry that I wanted to sing you a couple of songs. So I'm going to do that and, and try to answer some questions. And I'm trying to do this fast so that, because she said we need to keep this within an hour. So I'm going to work on that. The uh, first song I want to do for you is actually, remember the brother I told you about, Joe Ed, that, that uh, is a farrier in Wyoming? This is a true story, and as Joe Ed says, and some of it even really happened. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be all in tune here. We tried this, we decided to do it all acoustic because we're to hear Joe Ed's a Texas rounder and he grew up in between. The high plains and the blue sky and Amarillo was what I mean. He went to church on Sunday, played high school football too. Joe Ed grew up along In school, he paid attention on, he watched his P's and Q's. Bible school on Sunday, where he grew up straight through. Well, the preacher told him he was saved, baptized a Christian too. And on Monday morning, he looked out to see what the Christians do. Well, the Christians all were sinning, they begged. They'd go to church on Sunday, blame the devil for their sin. They had a good thing going, Joe Ed could see that too. He'd go out and have some fun, we could beg forgiveness too. College, but he got a lethal dose of brotherhood and knowledge. Law school came too close, so he decided he'd break free and live his life in full. Bought himself some cowboy clothes, started riding bull. He got bucked off a Tyler, came real close in San Antonio. He knew that when you're up there on
so pronounced. <laughs> um, you know, art, the kind of art that we deal with here is exclusive. It tries to get a real uh, knowledgeable audience. You know, we don't want like us the riffraff. <laughs> and music is totally opposite. They want to get everybody they can in the group. I'm looking for one here. I want to sing to you. These are my cheat sheets so that when I get nervous I can look over here and see what, what to do. This is a song called When It's All Over. These things come as uh, dreams, actually. I wake up and I have to get a recorder out. Loosen weight and get your 
B plus for content and a B plus for form. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering about the um, the relationship between making art and making music, and um, do you see them being different means to the same end for you? Yeah, but it's a very different uh, format. You know, I mean, artists make uh, discrete objects and take them to quiet places and and walk away for you know months and then come back and pick them up later. Uh, musicians stand in front of somebody for about three minutes and it's all direct. It's all happens right there. And if it doesn't happen, you know, it doesn't happen. Did you make music before? No. What I want to know is church choir. I have, I have a very talented musical family. My, bro my brother and my everyone was very talented. And, but no, I, I just sort of did it. And I just still do it as a hobby. It's my hobby. Well, I'm wondering if it's, I mean, I think it's really interesting and kind of curious that your work to me is just kind of 
thinly veiled need to say things. I mean, yeah. it's just there's their message is there. Well, it's very yeah, you know, it's very literal and it's very uh, portraying and it's very illustrative in a way, and, and it gets really close to being cute and popular and all this, all the time. And music very easily does that too. I mean, you, you can see just from one scene in the songs, at least the songs I'm doing, the songs I'm interested in, it's very much the same. But it's a very different way uh, to approach an audience, and the audience approaches it in a very different way than they do when they go in the museum. You know, something. Usually they're very serious when they go to the museum. You know. I don't know, I, I was very serious for a long, long time, but now I'm having fun. That's what it, it seems like maybe you've gotten to be, you know, an age where you have permission to not be contained. Right. So, Any other questions? What kind of art do you plan to do next? Well, I have a show in September, and it's in California, and I'm going to make some smaller dollar bill pieces uh, that are going to be less, not, not as big in scale. Um, and I'm going to start by making fingers and uh, legs that are laying down, but just legs that are laying down, stuff like that. Um, that's what's next, basically. And I've got a couple commissions out, which I may do, that are based on that on the victory and defeat and the bronze animals. And this show that's on tour right now, yeah. you said, when is it coming to low? Is that as close as it gets to us? Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to, I've been looking for places in Dallas or Houston to do it, uh, but I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, it's possible that it may. But it comes to low in about February. Is there a website or something? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, what would it be? Uh, it would probably be the Southwest School of Art and Craft in San Antonio. Probably. It's, it's, well, thank you. I'm glad you really like it. It was sure fun to make. <laughs> it's not fun to store it all around. <laughs> it's sure fun to make. Although the paper stuff is a lot easier to haul around than the, than the iron than the uh, bronze stuff. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much.